The protesters demanding the end of President Hosni Mubarak's government are not concerned with Israel very much. Uh, they have concerns closer to home, things like poverty, corruption, and political oppression. Uh, my guest is Avi Lipkin. He is an author and speaker and co-founder of Israel Today magazine. He's also served uh, 30 years with Israel Defense, Israeli Defense. Uh, Avi, uh, great pleasure. Thanks for taking the time today. Thank you for having me. So if, if the protesters succeed in toppling uh, the Mubarak uh, government, uh, Israelis fear that an alternative Egyptian government might prove a much more dangerous neighbor. Can you talk about that? Well, uh, let me say one thing. As someone who has been living here in Israel for the last 43 years, and uh, my wife is Egyptian, Egyptian Jewish, and uh, she was born and raised in Egypt the first 20 years of her life. She's an intelligence gatherer for the Israeli radio services. And uh, she follows very closely every move in Egypt. Uh, firstly, I wanted to say that I uh, supported uh, the peace process with uh, Egypt. We paid very dearly by returning uh, Sinai to Egypt a third time after we were attacked again and again and again by the Egyptians. And for peace, you know, uh, American President uh, Jimmy Carter made us give it back. So we gave it back. We had peace. It wasn't the best peace in the world. Um, the Egyptian media continued to attack Israel, very vicious anti-Semitic attacks. The school system was not very friendly to Israel. The, uh, the media, the, the lawyers' unions, the artists' unions, the uh, academic unions, these people who are today the liberals, uh, the liberal reformists, they all hate Israel. And uh, the Israeli government approach was, listen, as long as the guns are not firing and there can be no war without Egypt, a real war. And so as long as the guns are not firing, we have to count our blessings that we have peace with Egypt. That was fine until two, three weeks ago. Now, the problem here is that, and if you followed some of the uh, emails that have come out, and they are correct about the percentages, the majority of the Egyptians uh, still hate Israel, see Israel as enemy number one. Uh, in my first book, uh, Is Fanatic Islam a Global Threat, which came out in 1998, almost 20 years after the peace process started, uh, the Egyptian uh, war minister, Tantawi, and the former minister of war, Huwaidi, were both saying that Israel was the enemy and that Egypt was ready for war with Israel at any time. And, um, you know, there are there things we don't have time to talk about on your show today, but there was nearly a war a number of times with Egypt. And uh, through uh, grace uh, and mercy from God and <laughs> It's political intervention from Tony Blair and the U.S. president, and mm -hmm. the war was avoided with Egypt at the last moment every time. But the peace between Israel and Egypt is not a very friendly peace. It is a very cold peace. But it, you have to remember, the Egyptians got back Sinai. Uh, they got the oil and the gas uh, that was under the ground there and under the water in Sinai. Um, they got tremendous aid from the United States government, $1.3 just for the military. That's in addition to uh, civilian uh, infrastructure support. Uh, tremendous investment uh, to modernize the Egyptian economy. Mm -hmm. By the way, Israel set up factories in Egypt. Uh, so it was, a, I would say, a 50-50 type peace agreement. It wasn't really a good peace, but it was, again, it, there's no war. What we have today in Egypt is we have the fanatic Muslim Brotherhood, which calls mm -hmm. for immediate war with Israel. And then we have the other reformist groups that do not like Israel, but maybe will swallow a frog uh, if it's good for the Egyptian economy. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's very important. Now, the, 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 what I wanted to emphasize with you is that the uh, fanatic Muslim Brotherhood uh, does want a war with Israel, and they will do it as soon as they do come to power. They will get rid of the, uh, like Khomeini did in 1979, when they come to power together with a coalition of reformist parties, they will annihilate, they will get rid of the reformist parties who they mm -hmm. see as useful idiots. And there is no democracy in Islam. So what we will be seeing eventually, I don't know if it will take six months or a year, uh, we will see, like in Iran, uh, government overthrown uh, with the help of the President of the United States, becoming a fanatic Muslim government, uh, primarily uh, against Israel, but they may shut the Suez Canal because the Suez Canal mm -hmm. gives the United States and Europe its oil. Um, you know, uh, there, there are so many different scenarios here. There's sort of uh, worst case, best case, inter intermediate. None of them seem to be that appealing uh, for Israel a as a whole. What would be your, your, your greatest hope right now for something to end here? 
Well, the um, the peace with Israel is not something uh, that the President Mubarak uh, designed. It's something that was mm-hmm. designed by uh, Anwar Sadat uh, with the assassination of Anwar Sadat. By the way, by Muslim militants, Muslim Brotherhood militants, uh, Mubarak inherited this peace process. Like I said before, there were a number of almost war scenarios between Egypt and Israel during the last 30 years, which we're not going to get into on this show. Um, maybe in some other show, there's some very hot stuff I could share. By the way, the R in my book is Fanatic Islam, a Global Threat, which came out in 1998, based on uh, war games uh, that I participated in in Tel Aviv. Uh, that there was almost a war in, uh, in December, November, December 1996 with Egypt. Um, the, the Egyptian uh, infrastructure today is based on uh, capitalism, uh, it is based on uh, oil and gas sales to the world, and by the way, oil and gas sales to Israel. Uh, the Egyptian uh, economy has enjoyed tremendous influx of capital coming from all over the world. The, the Egyptian stock market was booming until two weeks ago. Um, things, you know, were looking pretty good, for, uh, you know, on the surface. The problem is, when you have two million new babies born every year, and at this stage, one million new people being thrown into the workplace every year. Uh, if you don't have some kind of family planning or family control, and if you have Muslim men marrying four wives and having uh, 50 children per family, uh, there is no rational economic system in the world that can provide the work for one million new workers every year and uh, two million new babies who will be on the workplace 20 years from now. Mm-hmm. So the, the, the Egyptian economy basically was uh, always floundering uh, on the verge of bankruptcy, because there is no way you can feed all these people. Mm-hmm. Uh, finally, this this whole um, upheaval here, you know, many people might assume is really religiously based, but isn't most of this this really a socio-economic kind of a problem within Egypt because of the the great lack of a middle class here? You have a very small percentage of very wealthy people, and then uh, the rest of the the country is living on, you know, two dollars a day. That has got to be a constant problem. How, how could things ever change there? Yeah, your point is very well taken. Uh, if you look at the history of Turkey, if mm-hmm. you look at the history of what has happened in Gaza, you have the fanatic Muslims establishing food kitchens, charity food kitchens to feed the poor. Uh, when the PLO was in Gaza, they stole everything from the people, and these are all mafia-type uh, characters, Arafat and Abu Mazen, and all these people. They're all mafia people. Palestinians know that. Uh, the, the Palestinians know that the people who will feed them are the Hamas. Hamas gets its money from Saudi Arabia, and they feed the poor. So again, when you have all these children who are hungry, you go to the mosque and you feed them. And so these become loyal soldiers to the mosque and to the Islamic religion. Turkey. Turkey enjoyed many decades of secular leadership under the, the, the followers of Kemal Ataturk, uh, the military, the just judicial system, the universities. Today, uh, because the secular Turks, the liberal Turks, have one child and one dog per family, and the fanatic Muslims have ten kids per family, and if they can't feed them, they go to the mosque. And so after 10, 20, 30 years of this, again, funded by the Saudis, uh, today you have a fanatic Islamic Hamas-type regime uh, under Erdogan in uh, Turkey. So you see this in Gaza, you see this in Turkey, and the same applies to Egypt. Egypt, like you said, $2 a day is not enough to feed a family. So what do you do? You go to the mosque. And so the Muslim Brotherhood was slated already uh, in the last elections to win, but the, the ballots were rigged, the ballots were stuffed you know, by the Mubarak forces. And in spite of all that, the uh, Muslim Brotherhood still got 20% of the vote. Mm-hmm. It, it's kind of like, um, according to what we feel here from what we see here in Israel, the Muslim Brotherhood could uh, get a majority in the next elections. And even if they only have 20 30%, they're the biggest of all the reformist groups. And if they come to power as part of a coalition, they will annihilate and uh, abolish all the other reformist groups, exactly as Khomeini did in 1979. Avi Lipkin is a co-founder of Israel Today magazine. He spent 30 years with uh, Israeli defense. Uh, Avi, a great pleasure. Thanks for taking the time today. Thank you very much. And my website is vicmord.com, V-I-C-M-O-R-D.com. And you're watching the Legal Broadcast Network.